consists of the last two lineages of parasitic plants. So. All right, thank you, um, and thank you all for coming to listen to my talk. Um, I'll be uh, talking about something, a topic that's, I think, come up in a number of you know, recent uh, botany meetings, um, and a lot of interest that has taken place in the last few years about trying to understand the plastome evolution in uh, parasitic plants. Um, and specifically, I'm going to be talking about Lenoaceae and Cremariaceae, which are two uh, of the many lineages of these plants, um, conveniently found in um, arid regions of the New World. So you could go out on a hike, um, and you know, potentially see both of these um, relatively close to here, although maybe not at this time of year. Um, heterotrophic plants are an amazing, uh, amazing twist on what we normally think of as, as the plant life history. Um, it, all of these different images here represent uh, different evolutionary origins of plants that have changed uh, their life history in order to obtain nutrients from other organisms um, instead of obtaining uh, them from you know, abiotic sources like the soil or um, you know, or using sunlight to do photosynthesis. Um, among the angiosperms, we probably have about 13 origins of direct parasitism. Um, these are where the plant is directly attached to the vascular tissue of its host. Um, and an alternative mode that people, or that some plants employ is called mitoheterotrophy. Uh, for example, this uh, monotropa, uh, in which instead of being directly connected <coughs> to its host, it's connected to mycorrhizal fungi that is then able to take photosynthates and nutrients and so forth from. Um, so these are kind of the two different flavors of heterotrophic plants, and I'm really just focusing on uh, the direct parasites. There's still a lot of work to do um, to understand even how many lineages of microheterotrophs there, there are um, across plants. Um, but I think by looking at just this smaller set of direct parasites, we can really learn a lot uh, about what happens to a normally highly conserved uh, part of the plant genome uh, when it undergoes this dramatic life history shift, which, as you can see, um, also induces substantial morphological, um, you know, ecological, so forth, uh, changes. So, uh, talking about the plastome, you know, these are the chloroplast genomes that are in plants, and just a quick kind of rundown of what exactly those are. Um, as I'm sure uh, many of you uh, may remember, the origin of these chloroplast genomes uh, was from an endosymbiosis event, you know, a very long time ago. Um, and since then, most of the genes that were in uh, you know, in the genomes of those um, ancient uh, bacteria have moved into the nucleus, but many are still retaining. Um, and, you know, don't worry about all these different gene names, but really, I just want to draw your attention to these specific classes of genes that are in the chloroplast genome. Um, and, so, and so these can really be divided into a couple different categories. Uh, first of all, we have genes that people often will call housekeeping genes. Um, these are genes that are involved in either, um, you know, just, uh, for example, you have you know, tRNAs or, or ribosomal RNAs, um, different genes that are re responsible for uh, just kind of maintaining transcription and translation, um, and also uh, replication processes uh, within that chloroplast genome. But then, and this is why it's particularly interesting in the world of parasitic plants, uh, there are many genes that are retained that are involved in various photosystems, uh, you know, or the light reactions specifically of photosynthesis. Um, as well as Rubisco and some other genes that are involved in this photosynthesis machinery, which of course is, is kind of the main function of um, chloroplasts in plants. And so the first, uh, the first parasitic plant genome was uh, sequenced in 1992. This was Epiphagus and Urban Casey. Uh, but in the last five to 10 years or so, there's, uh, as a result of increased or, um, methods for, for high throughput sequencing, um, and also, you know, just more interest in these, in these topics, there's really been an intense uh, look both among these different lineages, but then more deeply within a single lineage to look at um, what kinds of evolution is happening within uh, these parasitic plants. So this is from a paper that was published in 2003 uh, by Suzanne Wick and colleagues of looking at uh, a spectrum of different parasites, or different plants in the orbit of most of which are parasites. And so you can see, you know, from where you're sitting, these are just maps of the chloroplast genome stretched out um, and portrayed in a linear fashion, colored blocks referring to different genes. Um, and from where you're sitting, you know, probably the only thing you can notice is that there is a high variation in length. Um, and that's really what I want you to get out of this. And specifically, the, the parasitic plants that are still photosynthetic, we call these, um, you know, heterotrophs, still retain a chloroplast genome that's relatively uh, conserved and similar in both length and gene content to um, autotrophic plants. 
Um, overall, among angiosperms, the chloroplast genome is highly conserved in these areas. But when you become non photosynthetic, um, uh, you know, perhaps not unsurprisingly, you see this huge uh, variety of you know, the extent of plastome reduction, both in terms of number of genes um, and also which ones are lost. And so, okay, that's a maybe interesting pattern, but what about the process? And so from that, people have been interested in trying to you know, make more formalized uh, models uh, of plastome evolution, or we can think of it as, as degradation to some extent, um, once there's this relaxation of selection on photosynthesis. And so there's a number of different flavors of these models, and I can get into the specifics, but the idea is that you have these iterative, punctuated losses of, of different gene classes. Um, so, uh, in a follow-up paper, uh, Wick et al. proposed that the first genes that are lost are NDH genes, um, which are uh, not directly not involved um, in photosynthesis, and these are actually uh, uh, genes that code for um, nitrogen dehydrogenase um, enzymes. And in fact, these, these genes are lost relatively frequently in different lineages. Um, you know, bromeliads have lost them, uh, carnivorous plants, um, you know, cacti. And so it's not really a, uh, it's not something that you only see in parasitic plants. But nonetheless, um, it's often the first genes that you do see lost in these, in these lineages. And then a kind of a second wave of uh, relaxation of selection and gene loss uh, is, you know, causing a reduction in, or a loss of the photosystem complexes, um, and also plastid and coated polymerases. And then finally, a number of housekeeping, these housekeeping genes. Um, that are maybe you know, not as directly involved in, in that main function of these plastids. Now, this is one kind of flavor of this model, but other people have proposed you know, similar pictures, but maybe with, with slight variation as to which genes are in which plastids or how many there are in there. But the main point is that people are starting to really think from looking at you know, many different species within a lineage, um, and also multiple lineages of parasitic plants, that there's this iterative uh, punctuated loss. Of course, to test these hypotheses, we need to look at independent origins of evolution, kind of coming back to what I was telling you at the very beginning of this talk. And so here's just a, a map uh, showing the phylogeny of land plants uh, with these different colors uh, showing where heterotrophic lineages fall among uh, that phylogeny. You can see it's just well represented, um, you know, these independent origins across the tree of life. Um, and specifically, uh, the, the purple ones here are the direct parasites that I'm focusing on. So, uh, you know, people have kind of chipped, a, chipped away at this bit by bit, um, and kind of the exciting thing that for this talk is I'll be telling you about, uh, you know, two of these lineages, but with that, uh, when this work is complete, we'll have plastomes for all 13 lineages of these direct parasites, and then really be able to say, um, you know, we've looked, at, we've looked at all of these examples, and what can that, and what can that tell us? Kind of the most evidence that nature can bear on this question. Um, leaving out the high diversity of microheterotrophs, uh, which I won't really get into right now, but it's certainly worth, uh, worth pursuing for further. So here's all of those genomes arranged now um, in terms of length, and you can see there's a pretty much a continuous range from uh, lineages, mostly <coughs> heterotrophs uh, that are, or hetero, hemiparasites, excuse me, with intact plastomes all the way down to these that are um, almost nearly absent, or in the case of Rafflesia, uh, thought to be completely absent. Um, and here's just a heat map of all these different uh, chloroplast genes, uh, and you can see if they're dark shaded, that means they're inferred to have been lost, and the light color is, is retained. And you can see, you know, within these different classes indicated by the, the vertical black lines, um, you, you know, you can see that things do seem to be lost um, kind of chunk by chunk. Uh, and, you know, with maybe a few uh, scattered exceptions here and there. So, uh, to kind of get to the meat of the talk, what, you know, what are we learning now? What, what research uh, you know, have, have we done the last, uh, in this study to teach us about <coughs> these last two lineages that we haven't known before? Because there's a lot that's been done. So just to introduce the system, we have the Leno ACE um, formally, uh, or can also be a lineage within a traditionally larger circumscribed Varagin ACE. Um, and these are these really, you know, just bizarre, um, highly morphologically modified. You have this, these inflorescences here growing right out of the desert sand. Um, and, and, you know, just very extensive morphological reduction, but relatively little diversification um, in terms of lineages. And maybe this is the reason why people haven't, um, you know, haven't looked at this as carefully as some of the other lineages. 
Um, typically restricted to arid regions in the, in the New World here, you can see this little range map. Um, so we chose to sample two uh, different individuals uh, that span the basal node of this clade uh, to try to get a sense of how, both how much uh, plastomoss has happened along the stem lineage, but then also if you see any kind of species specific or lineage specific differences within that lineage. Um, and then, of course, it's always important to have a control, and so we also were looking at, um, we looked at Tequilia plicata, which is an uh, autotrophic relative in the sister clay uh, to the, to the Lenoaceae. On the other hand, Primariaceae is something that you may not, you know, you'd look at that growing in the field and you wouldn't think at all that it's a, it's a parasite. But for people who have taken the time to actually dig these plants up and look and follow their roots, um, all of the plants that have been studied in this small genus uh, to date have shown to, yes, be connected with other host roots. Um, and so, indeed, these plants are, are parasitic as far as we know. In fact, they're probably obligate parasites based on um, reports of trying to cultivate these. Uh, I haven't, in the literature, there aren't any uh, reports, at least that I'm aware of, that allow these plants to be cultivated without, unless you dig up all the neighboring plants around it, uh, you know, give them some sort of host. You know, again, a, a relatively old stem age, tons of error um, associated with this, but still, this is probably, you know, not a lineage that's just kind of sprung up uh, overnight. Um, and then, interestingly, there's been some functional work, where kind of a, an old study that thinks that maybe this parasitism is helping um, it continue to persist later in the summer. Uh, and so I think just I'm putting this in here as an emphasis that we really need to understand the ecology and ecophysiology of these plants to think of when we're thinking about these genomic changes. Um, and although there's 18 species, we only sampled one. Um, and then again, this autotrophic uh, relative in its sister clade, uh, the Zygophilaceae. Um, Typical uh, you know, methods, uh, we use genome skimming uh, because we were just looking at the chloroplast genome, which is involved in their high copy number, um, and, and did some de assemblies with a couple different programs you know, to check our work um, and so forth. Um, you can kind of just read about uh, these other different programs and whatnot. Um, there are some variations between the two different uh, parts of the study, the two different lineages, so you can see in some, we use different methods slightly between Lenoa and Cremaria, in part due to the nature of different problems we faced when trying to you know, annotate or um, assemble these genomes, but also because these were actually two different studies done at two different times that I'm here just kind of telling you about all together. So what, what did we learn? Well, we found that there's a loss of uh, many genes um, in the Lenoaceae, so here's Lenoa and Philisma, again those kind of vertical lasso maps uh, with only one of the two in really repeats shown here. But you can see they're about half the length or less than half the length of their autotrophic relative. Um, and if we kind of zoom in further to looking at uh, you know, particular gene content, we'll see that this fits these models really nicely. Uh, with all of the uh, photosystem, you know, photosystem um, genes missing um, in the genome, but also a lot of, almost all of the housekeeping genes uh, retained, you know, the ribosomal um, proteins, or, uh, or rRNA, um, yeah, sorry, ribosomal proteins, um, tRNAs, and so forth. Um, in addition, in spite of the, you know, relatively wide divergence between these two lineages, Philisma here and Lenoa here, um, they retain uh, almost identical gene contents in their chloroplast genome. So since that common ancestor, there's really been very little uh, chloroplast genome evolution, except for one interesting case of RBCL, uh, a gene that's involved a gene that codes for the large subunit of Rubisco, um, important carbon capturing enzyme, but you know, perhaps might also have other, um, other functions. And I'll finally point out that these uh, results generally match the findings uh, of an unpublished dissertation that we became aware of after completing this study. Um, so kind of a warning to people to you know, publish, your, publish your research. But also I want to you know, give credit to that we're not the only people who have looked at this. Uh, we happen to have been the first to, to publish it, however. Most of those genes um, that are retained seem to be under purifying selection. Uh, you can see these kind of DNDS uh, uh, plots. And if you kind of make these, you know, again, making very broad generalizations, many of the genes that are retained um, seem to have uh, relatively low ratios, indicating that they're under purifying selection. In some cases, uh, you have 
evidence for uh, neutral evolution or relaxed selection. But these are often um, R RBS uh, genes that are um, lost in other autotrophic lineages as well, um, often because there's a duplication in those genes actually moving into the nucleus. And then there's RBCL again still under purified selection. Um, so quickly to just sum up Cremaria, uh, we have a complete set of the coding genes uh, found, so a very different scenario um, in which nearly everything is intact, uh, both in gene content um, and also in, in length. Um, also some possible expansion of intergenic spacers, we're still kind of looking at that and, and trying to, and we're still looking at, into that. Um, finally, other selection analyses again support that many of these codons are still under purifying selection. This is a slightly different method than previously. Um, and just examples from some of these gene families. So just to very quickly conclude, we have two parasitic lineages with very different evolutionary trajectories. Although they've been around about the same amount of time and living in the same place, the Lenoaceae have shown you know, uh, substantial loss um, in their plastome as they've moved to being complete hollow parasites. Um, and the primary ACs show kind of the opposite pattern in which they're still retaining photosynthesis that seems to still be under strong uh, purifying selection. And I think it'd be really interesting to do a lot more um, ecophysiology studies on these, on these organisms to understand exactly you know, what benefit they might be having um, in terms of having that photosynthesis, although they're still able to parasitize. Um, and so, you know, just finally thank you to uh, people who deserve thanks. And for further reading, um, the one ways results are published. And so you can look at that for more. Thank you.